Chapter Seven, The Rescuer of Dames. One. It next happened that Denry began to suffer from the ravages of a malady which is almost worse than failure, namely a surfeit of success. The success was that of his Universal Thrift Club. This device, by which members, after subscribing one pound in weekly instalments, could at once get two pounds worth of goods at nearly any large shop in the district, appealed with enormous force to the democracy of the five towns. There was no need whatever for Denry to spend money on advertising. The first members of the club did all the advertising and made no charge for doing it. A stream of people anxious to deposit money with Denry in exchange for a card never ceased to flow into his little office in St. Luke's Square. The stream, indeed, constantly thickened. It was a wonderful invention, the Universal Thrift Club, and Denry ought to have been happy, especially as his beard was growing strongly and evenly and giving him the desired air of a man of wisdom and stability. But he was not happy. And the reason was that the popularity of the thrift club necessitated much bookkeeping, which he hated. He was an adventurer, in the old honest sense, and no clerk, and he found himself obliged not merely to buy large books of account, but to fill them with figures, and to do addition sums from page to page, and to fill up hundreds of cards, and to write out lists of shops, and to have long interviews with printers, whose proofs made him dream of lunatic asylums. And to reckon innumerable piles of small coins, and to assist his small office boy in the great task of licking envelopes and stamps. Moreover, he was worried by shopkeepers. Every shopkeeper in the district now wanted to allow him tuppence in the shilling on the purchases of club members, and he had to collect all the subscriptions in addition to his rents, and also to make personal preliminary inquiries as to the reputation of intending members. If he could have risen every day at four a.m. and stayed up working every night till four a.m., he might have got through most of the labour. He did, as a fact, come very near to this ideal, so near that one morning his mother said to him at her driest, "I suppose I might as well sell your bedstead, Denry." And there was no hope of improvement. Instead of decreasing, the work multiplied. What saved him was the fortunate death of Lawyer Lawton. The aged solicitor's death put the town into mourning and hung the church with black, but Denry, as a citizen, bravely bore the blow because he was able to secure the services of Penkethman, Lawyer Lawton's eldest clerk, who, after keeping the Lawton books and writing the Lawton letters for thirty-five years, was dismissed by young Lawton for being over fifty and behind the times. The desiccated bachelor was grateful to Denry. He called Denry Sir. Or rather, he called Denry's suit of clothes, sir, for he had a vast respect for a well-cut suit. On the other hand, he maltreated the little office boy, for he had always been accustomed to maltreating little office boys, not seriously, but just enough to give them an interest in life. Penkethman enjoyed desks, ledgers, pens, ink, rulers, and blotting paper. He could run from bottom to top of a column of figures more quickly than the fire engine could run up Oldcastle Street. And his totals were never wrong. His gesture with a piece of blotting paper as he blotted off a total was magnificent. He liked long hours. He was thoroughly used to overtime, and his boredom in his lodgings was such that he would often arrive at the office before the appointed hour. He asked thirty shillings a week, and Denry, in a mood of generosity, gave him thirty-one. He gave Denry his whole life and put a meticulous order into the establishment. Denry secretly thought him a miracle, but up at the club at Port Hill he was content to call him the human machine. I wind him up every Saturday night with a sovereign, half a sovereign, and a shilling," said Denry, "and he goes for a week. Compensated balance adjusted for all temperatures, no escapement, jewelled in every hole, ticks in any position, made in England." This jocularity of Denry's was a symptom that Denry's spirits were rising. The bearded youth was seen oftener in the streets behind his mule and his dog. The adventurer had indeed taken to the road again. After an emaciating period, he began once more to stouten. He was the image of success. He was the picturesque card whom everybody knew, and everybody had pleasure in greeting. In some sort, he was rather like the flag on the town hall. And then a graver misfortune threatened. It arose out of the fact. That though Denry was a financial genius, 
he was in no sense qualified to be a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants. The notion that an excess of prosperity may bring ruin had never presented itself to him, until one day he discovered that out of over two thousand pounds there remained less than six hundred to his credit at the bank. This was at the stage of the thrift club, when the founder of the thrift club was bound under the rules to give credit. When the original lady member had paid in her two pounds or so, she was entitled to spend four pounds or so at shops. She did spend four pounds or so at shops, and Denry had to pay the shops. He was thus temporarily nearly two pounds out of pocket, and he had to collect that sum by trifling instalments. Multiply this case by five hundred, and you will understand the drain on Denry's capital. Multiply it by a thousand, and you will understand the very serious peril which overhung Denry. Multiply it by fifteen hundred, and you will understand that Denry had been culpably silly to inaugurate a mighty scheme like the Universal Thrift Club on a paltry capital of two thousand pounds. He had. In his simplicity he had regarded two thousand pounds as boundless wealth. Although new subscriptions poured in, the drain grew more distressing. Yet he could not persuade himself to refuse new members. He stiffened his rules, and compelled members to pay at his office, instead of on their own doorsteps. He instituted fines for irregularity. But nothing could stop the progress of the Universal Thrift Club, and disaster approached. Denry felt as though he was being pushed nearer and nearer to the edge of a precipice by a tremendous multitude of people. At length, very much against his inclination, he put up a card in his window, but no new members could be accepted until further notice, pending the acquisition of larger offices and other arrangements. For the shrewd it was a confession of failure, and he knew it. Then the rumour began to form, and to thicken, and to spread, that Denry's famous Universal Thrift Club was unsound at the core, and that the teeth of those who had bitten the apple would be set on edge. And Denry saw that something great, something decisive, must be done, and done with rapidity. 2. His thoughts turned to the Countess of Chell. The original attempt to engage her moral support in aid of the Thrift Club had ended in a dangerous fiasco. Denry had been beaten by circumstances, and though he had emerged from the defeat with credit, he had no taste for defeat. He disliked defeat, even when it was served with jam, and his indomitable thoughts turned to the Countess again. He put it to himself in this way, scratching his head. "'I've got to get hold of that woman, and that's all about it.' The Countess, at this period, was busying herself with the policeman of the Five Towns, in her exhaustless passion for philanthropy, bazaars, and platforms, she had already dealt with orphans, the aged, the blind, potter's asthma, creches, churches, chapels, schools, economic cookery, the smoke nuisance, country holidays, Christmas puddings and blankets, healthy musical entertainments, and barmaids. The excellent and beautiful creature was suffering from a dearth of subjects when the policeman occurred to her. She made the benevolent discovery that policemen were overworked, underpaid, courteous and trustworthy public servants, and that our lives depended on them. And from this discovery it naturally followed that policemen deserved her energetic assistance, which assistance resulted in the erection of a policeman's institute at Hanbridge, the chief of the five towns. At the institute, policemen would be able to play at draughts, read the papers, and drink everything non-alcoholic at prices that defied competition. And the institute also conferred other benefits on those whom all the five mayors of the five towns fell into the way of describing as the stalwart guardians of the law. The institute, having been built, had to be opened with due splendour and ceremony, and naturally the Countess of Chell was the person to open it since without her it would never have existed. The solemn day was a day in March, and the hour was fixed for three o'clock, and the place was the large hall of the Institute itself, behind Crown Square, which is the Trafalgar Square of Hanbridge. The Countess was to drive over from Snade. Had the epoch been ten years later, she would have motored over, but probably that would not have made any difference to what happened. In relating what did happen, I confine myself to facts, eschewing imputations, 
it is a truism that life is full of coincidences, but whether these events comprised a coincidence or not, each reader must decide for himself, according to his cynicism, or his faith in human nature. The facts are, first, that Denry called one day at the house of Mrs. Kemp, a little lower down Broom Street, Mrs. Kemp being friendly with Mrs. Machin, and the mother of Jock, the Countess's carriage footman, whom Denry had known from boyhood. Second, that a few days later, when Jock came over to see his mother, Denry was present, and that subsequently Denry and Jock went for a stroll together in the cemetery, the principal resort of strollers in Bursley. Third, that on the afternoon of the opening ceremony, the Countess's carriage broke down in Snade Vale, two miles from Snade and three miles from Hambridge. Fourth, that five minutes later, Denry, in all his best clothes, drove up behind his mule. Fifth, that Denry drove right past the breakdown, apparently not noticing it. Sixth, that Jock, touching his hat to Denry as if to a stranger, for, of course, while on duty a footman must be dead to all humanities, said, "'Excuse me, sir,' and so caused Denry to stop. These are the simple facts. Denry looked round, with that careless half-turn of the upper part of the body which drivers of elegant equipages affect when their attention is called to something trifling behind them. The mule also looked round. It was a habit of the mules. And if the dog had been there, the dog would have shown an even livelier inquisitiveness. But Denry had left the faithful animal at home. "'Good afternoon, Countess,' he said, raising his hat, and trying to express surprise, pleasure, and imperturbability all at once. The Countess of Chell, who was standing in the road, raised her lorgnon, which was attached to the end of a tortoiseshell pole about a foot long, and regarded Denry. This lorgnon was a new device of hers, and it was already having the happy effect of increasing the sale of long-handled lorgnons throughout the five towns. "'Oh, it's you, is it?' said the Countess. "'I see you've grown a beard.' It was just this easy familiarity that endeared her to the district. As observant people put it, you never knew what she would say next, and yet she never compromised her dignity. "'Yes,' said Denry. "'Have you had an accident?' "'No,' said the Countess, bitterly. "'I'm doing this for idle amusement.' The horses had been taken out, and were grazing by the roadside like common horses. The coachman was dipping his skirts in the mud as he bent down in front of the carriage and twisted the pole to and fro and round about and round about. The footman, Jock, was industriously watching him. "'It's the pole-pin, sir,' said Jock. Denry descended from his own hammercloth. The Countess was not smiling. It was the first time that Denry had seen her without an efficient smile on her face. "'Have you got to be anywhere particular?' he asked. Many ladies would not have understood what he meant, but the Countess was used to the five towns. "'Yes,' said she, "'I've got to be somewhere particular. I've got to be at the Police Institute at three o'clock particular, Mr. Machin, and I shan't be. I'm late now. We've been here ten minutes.' The Countess was rather too often late for public ceremonies. Nobody informed her of the fact. Everybody, on the contrary, assiduously pretended that she had arrived the very second but she was well aware that she had a reputation for unpunctuality. Ordinarily, being too hurried to invent a really clever excuse, she would assert lightly that something had happened to her carriage. And now something in truth had happened to her carriage. But who would believe it in the police institute? "'If you'll come with me, I'll guarantee to get you there by three o'clock,' said Denry. The road thereabouts was lonely. A canal ran parallel with it at a distance of fifty yards, and on the canal the boat was moving in the direction of Hanbridge at the rate of a mile an hour. Such was the only other vehicle in sight. The outskirts of Snipe, the nearest town, did not begin until at least a mile further on, and the Countess, dressed for the undoing of mares and other unimpressionable functionaries, could not possibly have walked even half a mile in that rich dark mud. She thanked him, and without a word to her servants, took the seat beside him. Three. Immediately the mule began to trot, the Countess began to smile again. Relief and content were painted upon her handsome features. Denry soon learnt that she knew all about mules, or almost all, 
She told him how she had ridden hundreds of miles on mules in the Apennines, where there were no roads, and only mules, goats, and flies could keep their feet on the steep, stony paths. She said that a good mule was worth forty pounds in the Apennines, more than a horse of similar quality. In fact, she was very sympathetic about mules. Denry saw that he must drive with as much style as possible, and he tried to remember all that he had picked up from a book concerning the proper manner of holding the reins. For in everything that appertained to riding and driving, the Countess was an expert. In the season she hunted once or twice a week with the North Staffordshire hounds, and the signal had stated that she was a fearless horsewoman. It made this statement one day when she had been thrown and carried to Snade senseless. The mule, too, seemingly conscious of its responsibilities and its high destiny, put its best foot foremost, and behaved in general like a mule that knew the name of its great-grandfather. It went through Nipe in admirable style, not swerving at the steam-cars, nor exciting itself about the railway bridge. A photographer, who stood at his door manoeuvring a large camera, startled it momentarily, until it remembered that it had seen a camera before. The Countess, who wondered why on earth a photographer should be capering round a tripod in a doorway, turned to inspect the man with her lorgnon. They were now coursing up the Calden Bank towards Hanbridge. They were already within the boundaries of Hanbridge, and a pedestrian here and there recognised the Countess. You can hide nothing from the quidnunc of Hanbridge. Moreover, when a quidnunc in the streets of Hanbridge sees somebody famous or striking or notorious, he does not pretend that he has seen nobody. He points unmistakably to what he has observed, if he has a companion, and if he has no companion, he stands still and stares with such honest intensity that the entire street stands and stares too. Occasionally you may see an entire street standing and staring, without any idea of what it is staring at. As the equipage dashingly approached the busy centre of Hambridge, the region of fine shops, public houses, hotels, halls, and theatres, more and more of the inhabitants knew that Iris, as they affectionately called her, was driving with a young man in a tumble-down little Victoria behind a mule whose ears flapped like an elephant's. Denry being far less renowned in Hanbridge than in his native Bursley, few persons recognised him. After the Victoria had gone by, people who had heard the news too late rushed from shops and gazed at the Countess's back, as at a fading dream, until the insistent clang of a car-bell made them jump again to the footpath. At length Denry and the Countess could see the clock of the old town hall in Crown Square, and it was a minute to three. They were less than a minute off the Institute. "'There you are,' said Denry proudly. Three miles if it's a yard, in seventeen minutes. For a mule it's none so dusty.' And such was the Countess's knowledge of the language of the five towns, that she instantly divined the meaning of even that phrase, "non so dusty.' They swept into Crown Square grandly, and then, with no warning, the mule suddenly applied all the automatic brakes which a mule has, and stopped. "'Oh, law!' sighed Denry. He knew the cause of that arresting. A large squad of policemen, a perfect regiment of policemen, was moving across the north side of the square, in the direction of the Institute. Nothing could have seemed more reassuring, less harmful than that band of policemen, off duty for the afternoon, and collected together for the purpose of giving a hearty and policemanly welcome to their benefactress, the Countess. But the mule had his own views about policemen. In the early days of Denry's ownership of him, he had nearly always shied at the spectacle of a policeman. He would tolerate steam-rollers, and even falling kites, but a policeman had ever been antipathetic to him. Denry, by patience and punishment, had gradually brought him round almost to the Countess's view of policemen, namely, that they were a courteous and trustworthy body of public servants, not to be treated as scarecrows or the dregs of society. At any rate, the mule had of late months practically ceased to set his face against the policing of the five towns, and when he was on his best behaviour, he would ignore a policeman completely. But there were several hundreds of policemen in that squad, the majority of all the policemen in the five towns, and clearly the mule considered that Denry, in confronting him with several hundred policemen simultaneously, had been presuming upon his good nature. 
the mule's ears were saying agitatedly, "'A line must be drawn somewhere, and I have drawn it where my forefeet now are.' The mule's ears soon drew together a little crowd. It occurred to Denry that if mules were so wonderful in the Apennines, the reason must be that there are no policemen in the Apennines. It also occurred to him that something must be done to this mule. "'Well,' said the Countess, inquiringly, it was a challenge to him to prove that he, and not the mule, was in charge of the expedition. He briefly explained the mule's idiosyncrasy, as it were apologising for its bad taste in objecting to public servants whom the Countess cherished. "'They'll be out of sight in a moment,' said the Countess, and both she and Denry tried to look as if the Victoria had stopped in that special spot for a special reason, and that the mule was a pattern of obedience. Nevertheless, the little crowd was growing a little larger. "'Now,' said the Countess encouragingly, the tale of the regiment of policemen had vanished towards the Institute. <coughs> Denry persuaded the mule. No response from those forefeet. "'Perhaps I'd better get out and walk,' the Countess suggested. The crowd was becoming inconvenient, and had even begun to offer unsolicited hints as to the proper management of mules. The crowd was also saying to itself, "'It's her! It's her! It's her!' meaning that it was the Countess. "'Oh, no,' said Denry, "'it's all right,' and he caught the mule one over the head with his whip. The mule, stung into action, dashed away, and the crowd scattered as if blown to pieces by the explosion of a bomb. Instead of pursuing a right line, the mule turned within a radius of its own length, swinging the Victoria round after it, as though the Victoria had been a kettle attached to it with string, and Countess Denry and Victoria were wrapped with miraculous swiftness away, not at all towards the Policeman's Institute, but down Longshore Road, which is tolerably steep. They were pursued, but ineffectually, for the mule had bolted and was winged. They fortunately came into contact with nothing except a large barrow of carrots, turnips, and cabbages, which an old woman was wheeling up Longshore Road. The concussion upset the barrow, half filled the Victoria with vegetables, and for a second stayed the mule, but no real harm seemed to have been done, and the mule proceeded with vigour. Then the Countess noticed that Denry was not using his right arm, which swung about rather uselessly. "'I must have knocked my elbow against the barrow,' he muttered. His face was pale. "'Give me the reins,' said the Countess. "'I think I can turn the brute up here,' he said. And he did, in fact, neatly divert the mule up Birches Street, which is steeper even than Longshore Road. The mule, for a few instants, pretended that all gradients, up or down, were equal before its angry might. But Birches Street has the slope of a house-roof. Presently the mule walked— and then it stood still, and half Birches Street emerged to gaze, for the Countess's attire was really very splendid. "'I'll leave this here, and we'll walk back,' said Denry. "'You won't be late. That is nothing to speak of. The Institute is just round the top here.' "'You don't mean to say that you're going to let that mule beat you?' exclaimed the Countess. "'I was only thinking of your being late.' "'Oh, bother!' said she. "'Your mule may be ruined.' The horse-trainer in her was aroused. "'And then my arm,' said Denry. "'Shall I drive back?' the Countess suggested. "'Oh, do,' said Denry. "'Keep on up the street, and then to the left.' They changed places, and two minutes later she had brought the mule to an obedient rest in front of the police institute, which was all newly red with terracotta. The main body of policemen had passed into the building, but two remained at the door— and the mule haughtily tolerated them. The Countess dispatched one to Longshaw Road, to settle with the old woman whose vegetables they had brought away with them. The other policeman, who, owing to the Countess's philanthropic energy, had received a course of instruction in first aid, arranged a sling for Denry's arm. And then the Countess said that Denry ought certainly to go with her to the inauguration ceremony. The policeman whistled a boy to hold the mule. Denry picked a carrot out of the complex folds of the Countess's rich costume, and the Countess and her saviour entered the portico, and were therein met by an imposing group of important male personages, several of whom wore mayoral chains. 
Strange tales of what had happened to the Countess had already flown up to the Institute, and the chief expression on the faces of the group seemed to be one of astonishment that she still lived. 4. Denry observed that the Countess was now a different woman. She had suddenly put on a manner to match her costume, which in certain parts was stiff with embroidery. From the informal companion and the tamer of mules, she had miraculously developed into the public celebrity, the peeress of the realm, and the inaugurator-general of philanthropic schemes and buildings. Not one of the important male personages but would have looked down on Denry, and yet, while treating Denry as a jolly equal, the Countess, with all her embroidered and stiff politeness, somehow looked down on the important male personages, and they knew it. And the most curious thing was that they seemed rather to enjoy it. The one who seemed to enjoy it the least was Sir Jehoshaphat Dane, a white-bearded pillar of terrific imposingness. Sir G., as he was then beginning to be called, had recently been knighted, by way of reward for his enormous benefactions to the community. In the role of philanthropist he was really much more effective than the Countess. But he was not young, he was not pretty, he was not a woman, and his family had not helped to rule England for generations, at any rate, so far as anybody knew. He had made more money than had ever before been made by a single brain in the manufacture of earthenware, and he had given more money to public causes than a single pocket had ever before given in the five towns. He had never sought municipal honours, considering himself to be somewhat above such trifles. He was the first purely local man to be knighted in the five towns. Even before the bestowal of the knighthood his sense of humour had been deficient, and immediately afterwards it had vanished entirely. Indeed, he did not miss it. He divided the population of the kingdom into two classes, the titled and the untitled. With Sir G., either you were titled or you weren't. He lumped all the untitled together, and to be just to his logical faculty, he lumped all the titled together. There were various titles, Sir G. admitted that, but a title was a title, and therefore all titles were practically equal. The Duke of Norfolk was one titled individual, and Sir G. was another. The fine difference between them might be perceptible to the titled, and might properly be recognised by the titled when the titled were among themselves. But for the untitled, such a difference ought not to exist, and could not exist. Thus, for Sir G., there were two titled beings in the group, the Countess and himself. The Countess and himself formed one caste in the group, and the rest another caste. And although the Countess, in her punctilious demeanour towards him, gave due emphasis to his title, he returning more than due emphasis to hers, he was not precisely pleased by the undertones of suave condescension that characterised her greeting of him, as well as her greeting of the others. Moreover, he had known Denry as a clerk of Mr. Duncalf's, for Mr. Duncalf had done a lot of legal work for him in the past. He looked upon Denry as an upstart, a capering mountebank, and he strongly resented Denry's familiarity with the Countess. He further resented Denry's sling, which gave to Denry an interesting romantic aspect, despite his beard, and he more than all resented that Denry should have rescued the Countess from a carriage accident by means of his preposterous mule. Whenever the Countess, in the preliminary chatter, referred to Denry, or looked at Denry in recounting the history of her adventures, Sir G.'s soul squirmed, and his body sympathised with his soul. Something in him that was more powerful than himself compelled him to do his utmost to reduce Denry to a moral pulp, to flatten him, to ignore him, or to exterminate him by the application of ice. This tactic was no more lost on the Countess than it was on Denry and the Countess foiled it at every instant. In truth, there existed between the Countess and Sir G. a rather hot rivalry in philanthropy, and the cultivation of the higher welfare of the district. He regarded himself, and she regarded herself, as the most brightly glittering star of the five towns. When the Countess had finished the recital of her journey— and the faces of the group had gone through all the contortions proper to express terror, amazement, admiration, and manly sympathy, Sir G. took the lead, coughed, 
and said in his elaborate style, "'Before we adjourn to the hall, will not your ladyship take a little refreshment?' "'Oh, no, thanks,' said the Countess. "'I'm not a bit upset.' Then she turned to the ensling Denry, and with concern added, "'But will you have something?' If she could have foreseen the consequences of her question, she might never have put it. Still, she might have put it just the same. Denry paused an instant, and an old habit rose up in him. "'Oh, no, thanks,' he said, and turning deliberately to Sir G., he added, "'Will you?' This, of course, was mere crude insolence to the titled philanthropic white beard, but it was by no means the worst of Denry's behaviour. The group, every member of the group, distinctly perceived a movement of Denry's left hand towards Sir G. It was the very slightest movement, a wavering, a nothing. It would have had no significance whatever but for one fact. Denry's left hand still held the carrot. Everybody exhibited the most marvellous self-control, and everybody except Sir G. was secretly charmed, for Sir G. had never inspired love. It is remarkable how local philanthropists are unloved locally. The Countess, without blenching, gave the signal for what Sir G. called the adjournment to the hall. Nothing might have happened, yet everything had happened. 5. Next, Denry found himself seated on the temporary platform, which had been erected in the large games hall of the Policeman's Institute. The Mayor of Hanbridge was in the chair, and he had the Countess on his right, and the Mayoress of Bursley on his left. Other mayoral chains blazed in the centre of the platform, together with fine hats of mayoresses, and uniforms of police superintendents and captains of fire brigades. Denry's sling also contributed to the effectiveness. He was placed behind the Countess. Policemen, looking strange without helmets, and their wives, sweethearts, and friends, filled the hall to its fullest. Enthusiasm was rife and strident, and there was only one little sign that the untoward had occurred. That little sign was an empty chair in the first row near the Countess. Sir G., a prey to sudden indisposition, had departed. He had somehow faded away while the personages were climbing the stairs. He had faded away amid the expressed regrets of those few who, by chance, saw him in the act of fading, but even these bore up manfully. The high humour of the gathering was not eclipsed. Towards the end of the ceremony came the votes of thanks, and the principal of these was the vote of thanks to the Countess, prime cause of the Institute. It was proposed by the superintendent of Hanbridge Police. Other personages had wished to propose it, but the stronger right of the Hanbridge superintendent, as chief officer of the largest force of constables in the five towns, could not be disputed. He made a few facetious references to the episode of the Countess's arrival, and brought the house down by saying that if he did his duty he would arrest both the Countess and Denry for driving to the common danger. When he sat down, amid tempestuous applause, there was a hitch. According to the official programme, Sir Jehoshaphat Dane was to have seconded the vote, and Sir G. was not there. All that remained of Sir G. was his chair. The Mayor of Hanbridge looked round about, trying swiftly to make up his mind what was to be done, and Denry heard him whisper to another Mayor for advice. "'Shall I do it?' Denry whispered, and by at once rising relieved the Mayor from the necessity of coming to a decision." Impossible to say why Denry should have risen as he did, without any warning. Ten seconds before, five seconds before, he himself had not the dimmest idea that he was about to address the meeting. All that can be said is that he was subject to these attacks of the unexpected. Once on his legs he began to suffer, for he had never before been on his legs on a platform, or even on a platform at all. He could see nothing whatever except a cloud that had mysteriously and with frightful suddenness filled the room, and through this cloud he could feel that hundreds and hundreds of eyes were piercingly fixed upon him. A voice was saying inside him, "'What a fool you are! What a fool you are! I always told you you were a fool!' And his heart was beating as it had never beat, and his forehead was damp, his throat distressingly dry— and one foot nervously tap-tapping on the floor. This condition lasted for something like ten hours. 
during which time the eyes continued to pierce the cloud and him with patient, obstinate cruelty. Denry heard someone talking. It was himself. The superintendent had said, "'I have very great pleasure in proposing the vote of thanks to the Countess of Chell.' And so Denry heard himself saying, "'I have very great pleasure in seconding the vote of thanks to the Countess of Chell.' He could not think of anything else to say, and there was a pause, a real pause, not a pause merely in Denry's sick imagination. Then the cloud was dissipated, and Denry himself said to the audience of policemen, with his own natural tone, smile, and gesture, colloquially, informally, comically, "'Now then, move along there, please. I'm not going to say any more.' And for a signal he put his hands in the position for applauding, and sat down. He had tickled the stout ribs of every bobby in the place. The applause surpassed all previous applause. The most staid ornaments on the platform had to laugh. People nudged each other, and explained that it was that chap Machin from Bursley, as if to imply that that chap Machin from Bursley never let a day pass without doing something striking and humorous. The mayor was still smiling when he put the vote to the meeting, and the countess was still smiling when she responded. Afterwards, in the portico, when everything was over, Denry exercised his right to remain in charge of the countess. They escaped from the personages by going out to look for her carriage and neglecting to return. There was no sign of the countess's carriage, but Denry's mule and Victoria were waiting in a quiet corner. "'May I drive you home?' he suggested. But she would not. She said that she had a call to pay before dinner— and that her broom would surely arrive the very next minute. "'Will you come and have tea at the Sub Rosa?' Denry next asked. "'The Sub Rosa?' questioned the Countess. "'Well,' said Denry, "'that's what we call the new tea-room that's just been opened round here.' He indicated a direction. "'It's quite a novelty in the five towns.' The Countess had a passion for tea. "'They have splendid china tea,' said Denry. "'Well,' said the Countess, "'I suppose I may as well go through with it.' At the moment her broom drove up, she instructed her coachman to wait next to the mule and Victoria. Her demeanour had cast off all its similarity to her dress. It appeared to imply that, as she had begun with a mad escapade, she ought to finish with another one. Thus the Countess and Denry went to the tea-shop, and Denry ordered tea and paid for it. There was scarcely a customer in the place, and the few who were fortunate enough to be present had not the wit to recognise the Countess. The proprietress did not recognise the Countess. Later, when it became known that the Countess had actually patronised the Sub Rosa, half the ladies of Hanbridge were almost ill from the sheer disgust that they had not heard of it in time. It would have been so easy for them to be there, taking tea at the next table to the Countess, and observing her choice of cakes, and her manner of holding a spoon, and whether she removed her gloves or retained them in the case of a meringue, it was an opportunity lost that would in all human probability never occur again. And in the discreet corner which she had selected, the Countess fired a sudden shot at Denry. "'How did you get all those details about the state rooms at Snade?' she asked. "'Upon which opening?' The conversation became lively. The same evening, Denry called at the signal office, and gave an order for a half-page advertisement of the Five Towns Universal Thrift Club, patroness the Countess of Chell. The advertisement informed the public that the club had now made arrangements to accept new members. Besides the order for a half-page advertisement, Denry also gave many interesting and authentic details about the historic drive from Snade Vale to Hanbridge. The next day the signal was simply full of Denry and the Countess. It had a large photograph, taken by a photographer on Calden Bank, which showed Denry actually driving the Countess, and the Countess's face was full in the picture. It presented, too, an excellently appreciative account of Denry's speech— and it congratulated Denry on his first appearance in the public life of the five towns. In parenthesis, it sympathised with Sir G. in his indisposition. In short, Denry's triumph obliterated the memory of his previous triumphs. It obliterated, too, all rumours adverse to the thrift club, 
In a few days he had a thousand new members. Of course this addition only increased his liabilities, but now he could obtain capital on fair terms, and he did obtain it. A company was formed. The Countess had a few shares in this company. So, strangely, had Jock and his companion the coachman. Not the least of the mysteries was that when Denry reached his mother's cottage on the night of the tea with the Countess, his arm was not in a sling, and showed no symptom of having been damaged. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight, Raising a Wigwam One, a still young man, his age was thirty, with a short, strong beard peeping out over the fur collar of a vast overcoat, emerged from a cab at the snowy corner of St. Luke's Square and Broom Street, and paid the cabman with a gesture that indicated both wealth and habit of command. And the cabman, who had driven him over from Hanbridge through the winter night, responded accordingly. Few people take cabs in the five towns. There are few cabs to take. If you are going to a party, you may order one in advance by telephone, reconciling yourself also in advance to the expense. But to hail a cab in the street, without forethought, and jump into it as carelessly as you would jump into a tram, this is by very few done. The young man with the beard did it frequently, which proved that he was fundamentally ducal. He was encumbered with a large and rather heavy parcel as he walked down Broom Street, and moreover the footpath of Broom Street was exceedingly dirty, and yet no one acquainted with the circumstances of his life would have asked why he had dismissed the cab before arriving at his destination, because everyone knew. The reason was that this ducal person, with gestures of command, dared not drive up to his mother's door in a cab oftener than about once a month. He opened that door with a latch-key. A modern lock was almost the only innovation that he had succeeded in fixing on his mother, and stumbled with his unwieldy parcel into the exceedingly narrow lobby. "'Is that you, Denry?' called a feeble voice from the parlour. "'Yes,' said he, and went into the parlour, hat, fur coat, parcel, and all. Mrs. Machin, in a shawl and an antimacassar over the shawl, sat close to the fire, and leaning towards it. She looked cold and ill. Although the parlour was very tiny, and the fire comparatively large, the structure of the grate made it impossible that the room should be warm, as all the heat went up the chimney. If Mrs. Machin had sat on the roof, and put her hands over the top of the chimney, she would have been much warmer than at the grate. "'You aren't in bed?' Denry queried. "'Can't you see?' said his mother. And, indeed, to ask a woman who was obviously sitting up in a chair whether she was in bed did seem somewhat absurd. She added, less sarcastically, "'I was expecting ye every minute. Where have ye had ye tea?' "'Oh,' he said lightly, "'in Hanbridge.' An untruth. He had not had his tea anywhere, but he had dined richly at the new Hotel Metropole in Hanbridge. "'What have you got there?' asked his mother. "'A present for you,' said Denry. "'It's your birthday to-morrow.' "'I don't know as I want reminding of that,' murmured Mrs. Machin. But when he had undone the parcel, and held up the contents before her, she exclaimed, "'Bless us!' The staggered tone was an admission that for once, in a way, he had impressed her. It was a magnificent sealskin mantle, longer than sealskin mantles usually are, it was one of those articles, the owner of which can say, "'Nobody can have a better than this. I don't care who she is.' It was worth, in monetary value, all the plain shabby clothes on Mrs. Machin's back, and all her very ordinary best clothes upstairs, and all the furniture in the entire house, and perhaps all Denry's dundarkle wardrobe too, except his fur coat. If the entire contents of the cottage— with the aforesaid exception, had been put up to auction, they would not have realised enough to pay for that sealskin mantle. Had it been anything but a sealskin mantle, and equally costly, Mrs. Machin would have abraded. But a sealskin mantle is not showy. It goes with any and every dress and bonnet, and the most respectable, the most conservative, 
the most austere woman may find legitimate pleasure in wearing it. A sealskin mantle is the sole luxurious ostentation that a woman of Mrs. Machin's temperament, and there are many such in the five towns and elsewhere, will conscientiously permit herself. "'Try it on,' said Denry. She rose weakly and tried it on. It fitted as well as a sealskin mantle can fit. "'My word, it's warm,' she said. This was her sole comment. "'Keep it on,' said Denry. His mother's glance withered the suggestion. "'Where are you going?' he asked, as she left the room. "'To put it away,' said she. "'I must get some moth powder to-morrow.' He protested with inarticulate noises, removed his own furs, which he threw down on to the old worn-out sofa, and drew a Windsor chair up to the fire. After a while his mother returned, and sat down in her rocking-chair, and began to shiver again under the shawl and the antimacassar. The lamp on the table lighted up the left side of her face, and the right side of his. "'Look here, mother,' said he, "'you must have a doctor.' "'I shall have no doctor. "'You've got influenza, and it's a very tricky business, influenza is. "'You never know where you are with it.' "'You can call it influenza if you like,' said Mrs. Machin. "'There was no influenza in my young days. We called a cold a cold.' "'Well,' said Denry, "'you aren't well, are you?' "'I never said I was,' she answered grimly. "'No,' said Denry, with the triumphant ring of one who is about to devastate an enemy. "'And you never will be in this rotten old cottage.' "'This was reckoned a very good class of house when your father and I came into it, "'and it's always been kept in repair. "'It was good enough for your father, and it's good enough for me. "'I don't see myself flitting. "'But some folks have gotten so grand. "'As for health, old Reuben next door is ninety-one. "'How many people over ninety are there in those gimcrack houses up by the park, I should like to know?' "'Denry could argue with any one, save his mother.' Always, when he was about to reduce her to impotence, she fell on him thus, and rolled him in the dust. Still he began again. "'Do we pay four and sixpence a week for this cottage, or don't we?' he demanded. "'And always have done,' said Mrs. Machin. "'I should like to see the landlord put it up,' she added, formidably, as if to say, "'I'd landlord him if he tried to put my rent up.' "'Well,' said Denry, "'here we are, living in a four-and-six-a-week cottage. "'And do you know how much I'm making? "'I'm making two thousand pounds a year. "'That's what I'm making.' "'A second wilful deception of his mother. "'As managing director of the Five Towns Universal Thrift Club, "'as proprietor of the majority of its shares, "'as its absolute autocrat, "'he was making very nearly four thousand a year. "'Why could he not as easily have said four as two to his mother?' The simple answer is that he was afraid to say four. It was as if he ought to blush before his mother for being so plutocratic, his mother who had passed most of her life in hard toil to gain a few shillings a week. Four thousand seemed so fantastic. And, in fact, the thrift club, which he had invented in a moment, had arrived at a prodigious success, with its central offices in Hanbridge and its branch offices in the other four towns, and its scores of clerks and collectors, presided over by Mr. Penkethman. It had met with opposition. The mighty said that Denry was making an unholy fortune under the guise of philanthropy, and to be on the safe side the Countess of Chell had resigned her official patronage of the club, and given her shares to the Pye Hill Infirmary, which had accepted the high dividends on them without the least protest. As for Denry, he said that he had never set out to be a philanthropist, nor posed as one, and that his unique intention was to grow rich by supplying a want like the rest of them, and that anyhow there was no compulsion to belong to his thrift club. Then letters in his defence from representatives of the thousands and thousands of members of the club rained into the columns of the signal, and Denry was the most discussed personage in the county. It was stated that such thrift clubs under various names existed in several large towns in Yorkshire and Lancashire, this disclosure rehabilitated Denry completely in general esteem, for whatever obtains in Yorkshire and Lancashire must be right for Staffordshire. But it rather dashed Denry 
who was obliged to admit to himself that, after all, he had not invented the thrift club. Finally, the hundreds of tradesmen who had bound themselves to allow a discount of tuppence in the shilling to the club, sole source of the club's dividends, had endeavoured to revolt. Denry effectually cowed them by threatening to establish cooperative stores. There was not a single cooperative store in the five towns. They knew he would have the wild audacity to do it. Thenceforward the progress of the thrift club had been unruffled. Denry waxed amazingly in importance. His mule died. He dared not buy a proper horse and dog-cart, because he dared not bring such an equipage to the front door of his mother's four-and-sixpenny cottage. So he had taken to cabs. In all exterior magnificence and lavishness he equalled even the great Harold Etches, of whom he had once been afraid. And like Etches he became a famous habitué of Flandidno Pier. But whereas Etches lived with his wife in a superb house at Bleakridge, Denry lived with his mother in a ridiculous cottage in ridiculous Broom Street. He had a regiment of acquaintances, and he accepted a lot of hospitality, but he could not return it at Broom Street. His greatness fizzled into nothing in Broom Street. It stopped short and sharp at the corner of St. Luke's Square, where he left his cabs. He could do nothing with his mother. If she was not still going out as a seamstress, the reason was not that she was not ready to go out, but that her old clients had ceased to send for her. And could they be blamed for not employing at three shillings a day the mother of a young man who wallowed in thousands sterling? Denry had essayed over and over again to instil reason into his mother, and he had invariably failed. She was too independent, too profoundly rooted in her habits, and her character had more force than his. Of course, he might have left her and set up a suitably gorgeous house of his own, but he would not. In fact, they were a remarkable pair. On this eve of her birthday he had meant to cajole her into some step, to win her by an appeal, basing his argument on her indisposition. But he was being beaten off once more. The truth was that a cajoling, caressing tone could not be long employed towards Mrs. Machin. She was not persuasive herself, nor favourable to persuasiveness in others. "'Well,' said she, "'if you're making two thousand a year, you can spend it or save it as you like, though you'd better save it. You never know what may happen in these days.' There was a man dropped half a crown down a grid opposite only the day before yesterday. Denry laughed. Aye, she said, you can laugh. There's no doubt about one thing, he said. You ought to be in bed. You ought to stay in bed for two or three days at least. Yes, she said, and who's going to look after the house while I'm moping between blankets? You can have Rose Chud in, he said. No, said she. I'm not going to have any woman rummaging about my house and me in bed. You know perfectly well she's been practically starving since her husband died, and as she's going out charring, why can't you have her and put a bit of bread into her mouth? Because I won't have her, neither her nor any one. There's naught to prevent you giving some of your two thousand a year, if you're a mind. But I see no reason for my house being turned upside down by her, even if I have got a bit of a cold. "'You're an unreasonable old woman,' said Denry. "'Happen I am,' said she. "'There can't be two wise ones in a family. "'But I'm not going to give up this cottage, "'and as long as I'm standing on my feet, "'I'm not going to pay any one for doing what I can do better myself.' "'A pause. "'And so you needn't think it. "'You can't come round me with a fur mantle.' "'She retired to rest. "'On the following morning he was very glum.' "'You needn't miss a glum,' she said. But she was rather pleased at his glumness, for in him glumness was a sign that he recognised defeat. 2. The next episode between them was curiously brief. Denry had influenza. He said that naturally he had caught hers. He went to bed and stayed there. She nursed him all day, and grew angry in a vain attempt to force him to eat. Towards night he tossed furiously on the little bed in the little bedroom, complaining of fearful headaches. She remained by his side most of the night. In the morning he was easier. Neither of them mentioned the word doctor. She spent the day largely on the stairs. Once more towards night he grew worse. 
and she remained most of the second night by his side. In the sinister winter dawn, Denry murmured in a feeble tone, "'Mother, you'd better send for him.' "'Doctor?' she said, and secretly she thought that she had better send for the doctor, and that there must be, after all, some difference between influenza and a cold. "'No,' said Denry, "'send for young Lawton.' "'Young Lawton?' she exclaimed. "'What do you want young Lawton to come here for?' "'I haven't made my will,' Denry answered. "'Oh!' she retorted. Nevertheless, she was the least bit in the world frightened, and she sent for Dr. Stirling, the aged Harrop's Scotch partner. Dr. Stirling, who was full-bodied, and left little space for anybody else in the tiny, shabby bedroom of the man with four thousand a year, gazed at Mrs. Machin, and he gazed also at Denry. "'You must go to bed this minute,' said he. "'But he is in bed,' cried Mrs. Machin. "'I mean yourself,' said Dr. Stirling. She was very nearly at the end of her resources, and the proof was that she had no strength left to fight Dr. Stirling. She did go to bed, and shortly afterwards Denry got up, and a little later Rose Chudd, that prim and efficient young widow from lower down the street, came into the house and controlled it as if it had been her own. Mrs. Machin, whose constitution was hardy, arose in about a week, cured, and duly dismissed Rose, with wages and without thanks. But Rose had been. Like the signal's burglars, she had effected an entrance, and the house had not been turned upside down. Mrs. Machin, though she tried, could not find fault with the results of Rose's uncontrolled activities. 3. One morning, and not very long afterwards, in such wise did fate seem to favour the young at the expense of the old, Mrs. Machin received two letters which alarmed and disgusted her. One was from her landlord, announcing that he had sold the house in which she lived to a Mr. Wilbraham of London, and that in future she must pay the rent to the said Mr. Wilbraham or his legal representatives. The other was from a firm of London solicitors, announcing that their client, Mr. Wilbraham, had bought the house, and that the rent must be paid to their agent, whom they would name later. Mrs. Machin gave vent to her emotion in her customary manner. "'Bless us!' And she showed the impudent letters to Denry. "'Oh,' said Denry, "'so he has bought them, has he? I heard he was going to.' "'Them?' exclaimed Mrs. Machin. "'What else has he bought?' "'I expect he's bought all the five, this and the four below, as far as downs. I expect you'll find that the other four have had notices just like these.' "'You know all this row used to belong to the Wilbrahams. "'You surely must remember that, mother.' "'Is he one of the Wilbrahams of Hillport, then?' "'Yes, of course he is.' "'I thought the last of them was Cecil, "'and when he'd beggared himself here he went to Australia and died of drink. "'That's what I always heard. "'We always used to say as there wasn't a Wilbraham left. "'He did go to Australia, but he didn't die of drink. "'He disappeared.' "'and when he'd made a fortune he turned up again in Sydney, so it seems. "'I heard he's thinking of coming back here to settle. "'Anyhow, he's buying up a lot of the Wilbraham property. "'I should have thought you'd have heard of it. "'Why, lots of people have been talking about it.' "'Well,' said Mrs. Machin, "'I don't like it.' "'She objected to a law which permitted a landlord to sell a house "'over the head of a tenant who had occupied it for more than thirty years.' In the course of the morning she discovered that Denry was right. The other tenants had received notices, exactly similar to hers. Two days later Denry arrived home for tea with a most surprising article of news. Mr. Cecil Wilbraham had been down to Bursley from London, and had visited him, Denry. Mr. Cecil Wilbraham's local information was evidently quite out of date, for he had imagined Denry to be a rent-collector and estate agent whereas the fact was that Denry had abandoned this mine of occasion years ago. His desire had been that Denry should collect his rents and watch over his growing interests in the district. "'So what did you tell him?' asked Mrs. Machin. "'I told him I'd do it,' said Denry. "'Why?' "'I thought it might be safer for you,' said Denry, with a certain emphasis. "'And besides, it looked as if it might be a bit of a lark. He's a very peculiar chap.' "'Peculiar?' 
"'For one thing, he's got the largest moustaches of any man I ever saw, "'and there's something up with his left eye. "'Now I think he's a bit mad. "'Mad? Well, touched. "'He's got a notion about building a funny sort of house for himself "'on a plot of land at Bleakridge. "'It appears he's fond of living alone, "'and he's collected all kinds of dodges for doing without servants, "'still being comfortable. "'Aye, but he's right there.' breathed Mrs. Machin in deep sympathy. As she said about once a week, she never could abide the idea of servants. "'He's not married, then,' she added. "'He told me he'd been a widower three times, but he'd never had any children,' said Denry. "'Bless us!' murmured Mrs. Machin. Denry was the one person in the town who enjoyed the acquaintance and the confidence of the thrice-widowed stranger with long moustaches. He had descended without notice on Bursley, seen Denry at the branch office of the thrift club, and then departed. It was understood that later he would permanently settle in the district. Then the wonderful house began to rise on the plot of land at Bleakridge. Denry had general charge of it, but always subject to erratic and autocratic instructions from London. Thanks to Denry— who, since the historic episode at Llandidno, had remained very friendly with the Cotterill family, Mr. Cotterill had the job of building the house. The plans came from London, and though Mr. Cecil Wilbraham proved to be exceedingly watchful against any form of imposition, the job was a remunerative one for Mr. Cotterill, who talked a great deal about the originality of the residence. The town judged of the wealth and importance of Mr. Cecil Wilbraham by the fact that a person so wealthy and important as Denry should be content to act as his agent. But then the Wilbrahams had been magnates in the Bursley region for generations, up till the final Wilbraham smash in the late seventies. The town hungered to see those huge moustaches and that peculiar eye. In addition to Denry, only one person had seen the madman, and that person was Nelly Cotterill, who had been viewing the half-built house with Denry one Sunday morning, when the madman had most astonishingly arrived upon the scene, and after a few minutes vanished. The building of the house strengthened greatly the friendship between Denry and the Cotterills, yet Denry neither liked Mr. Cotterill nor trusted him. The next incident in this happening was that Mrs. Machin received notice from the London firm to quit her four-and-sixpence-a-week cottage. It seemed to her that not merely Broom Street, but the world, was coming to an end. She was very angry with Denry for not protecting her more successfully. He was Mr. Wilbraham's agent, he collected the rent, and it was his duty to guard his mother from unpleasantness. She observed, however, that he was remarkably disturbed by the notice, and he assured her that Mr. Wilbraham had not consulted him in the matter at all. He wrote a letter to London, which she signed demanding the reason of this absurd notice flung at an ancient and perfect tenant. The reply was that Mr. Wilbraham intended to pull the houses down, beginning with Mrs. Machin's, and rebuild. Pooh, said Denry. "'Don't you worry ahead, mother. I shall arrange it. He'll be down here soon to see his new house. It's practically finished, and the furniture's coming in, and I'll just talk to him.' But Mr. Wilbraham did not come the explanation doubtless being that he was mad. On the other hand, fresh notices came with amazing frequency. Mrs. Machin just handed them over to Denry, and then Denry received a telegram to say that Mr. Wilbraham would be at his new house that night and wished to see Denry there. Unfortunately, on the same day by the afternoon post, while Denry was at his offices, there arrived a sort of supreme and ultimate notice from London to Mrs. Machin, and it was on blue paper. It stated, baldly, that as Mrs. Machin had failed to comply with all the previous notices, had indeed ignored them, she and her goods would now be ejected into the street according to the law. It gave her twenty-four hours' notice to flit. Never had a respectable dame been so insulted as Mrs. Machin was insulted by that notice. The prospect of camping out in Broom Street confronted her. When Denry reached home that evening— Mrs. Machin, as the phrase is, gave it him. Denry admitted frankly that he was nonplussed, staggered, and outraged, but the thing was simply another proof of Mr. Wilbraham's madness. After tea he decided that his mother must put on her best clothes and go up with him to see Mr. Wilbraham and firmly expostulate. 
In fact, they would arrange the situation between them, and if Mr. Wilbraham was obstinate, they would defy Mr. Wilbraham. Denry explained to his mother that an English woman's cottage was her castle, that our landlord's minions had no right to force an entrance, and that the one thing that Mr. Wilbraham could do was to begin unbuilding the cottage from the top, outside, and he would like to see Mr. Wilbraham try it on. So the sealskin mantle, for it was spring again, went up with Denry to Bleakridge. 4. The moon shone in the chill night. The house stood back from Trafalgar Road in the moonlight, a squarish block of a building. "'Oh,' said Mrs. Machin, "'it isn't so large.' "'No, he didn't want it large. He only wanted it large enough,' said Denry, and pushed a button to the right of the front door. There was no reply, though they heard the ringing of the bell inside. They waited. Mrs. Machin was very nervous, but thanks to her sealskin mantle she was not cold. "'This is a funny doorstep,' she remarked, to kill time. "'It's of marble,' said Denry. "'What's that for?' asked his mother. "'So much easier to keep clean,' said Denry. "'Well,' said Mrs. Machin, "'it's pretty dirty now, anyway.' "'It was.' "'Quite simple to clean.' said Denry, bending down. You just turn this tap at the side. You see, it's so arranged that it sends a flat jet along the step. Stand off for a second. He turned the tap, and the step was washed pure in a moment. How is it that that water steams? Mrs. Machin demanded. Because it's hot, said Denry. Did you ever know water steam for any other reason? Hot water outside? "'Just as easy to have hot water outside as inside, isn't it?' said Denry. "'Well, I never!' exclaimed Mrs. Machin. She was impressed. "'That's how everything's dodged up in this house,' said Denry. He shut off the water, and he rang once again. No answer. No illumination within the abode. "'I'll tell you what I shall do,' said Denry, at length. "'I shall let myself in. I've got a key of the back door.' "'Are you sure it's all right?' "'I don't care if it isn't all right,' said Denry defiantly. "'He asked me to be up here, and he ought to be here to meet me. "'I'm not going to stand any nonsense from anybody.' "'In they went, having skirted round the walls of the house. "'Denry closed the door, pushed the switch, and the electric light shone. "'Electric light was then quite a novelty in Bursley. "'Mrs. Machin had never seen it in action.' She had to admit that it was less complicated than oil lamps. In the kitchen the electric light blazed upon walls tiled in grey and a floor tiled in black and white. There was a gas range and a marble slopstone with two taps. The woodwork was dark. Earthenware saucepans stood on a shelf. The cupboards were full of gear, chiefly in earthenware. Dendry began to exhibit to his mother a tank provided with ledges and shelves and grooves, in which he said everything except knives could be washed and dried automatically. "'Hadn't you better go and find your Mr. Wilbraham?' she interrupted. "'So I had,' said Denry. "'I was forgetting him.' She heard him wandering over the house, and calling in divers tones upon Mr. Wilbraham, but she heard no other voice. Meanwhile, she examined the kitchen in detail— appreciating some of its devices, and failing to comprehend others. "'I expect he's missed the train,' said Denry, coming back. "'Anyhow, he isn't here. I may as well show you the rest of the house now.' He led her into the hall, which was radiantly lighted. "'It's quite warm here,' said Mrs. Machin. "'The whole house is heated by steam,' said Denry. "'No fireplaces.' "'No fireplaces?' "'No, no fireplaces, no grates to polish, ashes to carry down, coals to carry up, mantelpieces to dust, fire-irons to clean, fenders to polish, chimneys to sweep. "'And suppose he wants a bit of a fire all of a sudden in summer?' "'Gas-stove in every room for emergencies,' said Denry. She glanced into a room. "'But,' she cried, "'it's all complete, ready, and as warm as toast.' "'Yes,' said Denry, "'he gave orders.' "'I can't think why on earth he isn't here.' "'At that moment an electric bell rang loud and sharp, "'and Mrs. Machin jumped. "'There he is,' said Denry, moving to the door. "'Bless us! What will he think of us being here like?' 
Mrs. Machin mumbled. Pooh, said Denry carelessly, and he opened the door. Five. Three persons stood on the newly washed marble step, Mr. and Mrs. Cotterill and their daughter. Oh, come in, come in, make yourselves quite at home. That's what we're doing, said Denry in blithe greeting, and added, I suppose he's invited you too? And it appeared that Mr. Cecil Wilbraham had indeed invited them too. He had written from London, saying that he would be glad if Mr. and Mrs. Cotterill would drop in on this particular evening. Further, he had mentioned that, as he had already had the pleasure of meeting Miss Cotterill, perhaps she would accompany her parents. "'Well, he isn't here,' said Denry, shaking hands. "'He must have missed his train or something. He can't possibly be here now until to-morrow. But the house seems to be all ready for him.' "'Yes, my word. And how's yourself, Mrs. Cotterill?' put in Mrs. Machin. "'So we may as well look over it in its finished state.' "'I suppose that's what he's asked us up for,' Denry concluded. Mrs. Machin explained quickly and nervously that she had not been compromised in any invitation, that her errand was pure business. "'Come on upstairs,' Denry called out, turning switches and adding radiance to radiance. "'Denry,' his mother protested, "'I'm sure I don't know what Mr. and Mrs. Cotterill will think of you. You carry on as if you owned everything in the place. I wonder at you.' "'Well,' said Denry, "'if anybody in this town is the owner's agent, I am. "'And Mr. Cottrell has built the blessed house. "'If Wilbraham wanted to keep his old shanty to himself, "'he shouldn't send out invitations. "'It's simple enough not to send out invitations. "'Now, Nellie, he was hanging over the balustrade at the curve of the stairs. "'The familiar ease with which he said, "'Now, Nellie,' and especially the spontaneity of Nellie's instant response, put new thoughts into the mind of Mrs. Machin. But she neither pricked up her ears, nor started back, nor accomplished any of the acrobatic feats which an ordinary mother of a wealthy son would have performed under similar circumstances. Her ears did not even tremble, and she just said, "'I like this balustrade knob being of black china.' "'Every knob in the house is of black china,' said Denry. "'Never shows dirt. "'But if you should take it into your head to clean it, "'you can do it with a damp cloth in a second. "'Nellie now stood beside him. "'Nellie had grown up since the Sandidno episode. "'She did not blush at a glance. "'When spoken to suddenly, she could answer without torture to herself. "'She could, in fact, maintain a conversation without breaking down "'for a much longer time than, a few years back, "'she had been able to skip without breaking down.' She no longer imagined that all the people in the street were staring at her, anxious to find faults in her appearance. She had temporarily ruined the lives of several amiable and fairly innocent young men by refusing to marry them, for she was pretty, and her father cut a figure in the town, though her mother did not. And yet, despite the immense accumulation of her experiences, and the weight of her varied knowledge of human nature, there was something very girlish and timidly roguish about her, as she stood on the stairs near Denry, waiting for the elder generation to follow. The old Nelly still lived in her. The party passed to the first floor, and the first floor exceeded the ground floor in marvels. In each bedroom two aluminium taps poured hot and cold water, respectively, into a marble basin, and below the marble basin was a sink. No portrait of water anywhere in the house. The water came to you and every room consumed its own slops. The bedsteads were of black enamelled iron, and very light. The floors were covered with linoleum, with a few rugs that could be shaken with one hand. The walls were painted with grey enamel. Mrs. Cotterill, with her all-seeing eye, observed a detail that Mrs. Machin had missed. There were no sharp corners anywhere. Every corner, every angle between wall and floor, or wall and wall, was rounded, to facilitate cleaning and every wall, floor, ceiling, and fixture could be washed, and all the furniture was enamelled, and could be wiped with a cloth in a moment, instead of having to be polished with three cloths and as many odours in a day and a half. The bathroom was absolutely waterproof. You could spray it with a hose, and by means of a gas apparatus you could produce an endless supply of hot water, independent of the general supply. Denry was apparently familiar with each detail of Mr. Wilbraham's manifold contrivances, and he explained them with an enormous gusto. "'Bless us!' 
said Mrs. Machin. "'Bless us!' said Mrs. Cotterill, doubtless the force of example. They descended to the dining-room, where a supper-table had been laid by order of the invisible Mr. Cecil Wilbraham, and there the ladies lauded Mr. Wilbraham's wisdom in eschewing silver. Everything of the table service that could be of earthenware was of earthenware. The forks and spoons were electroplate. "'Why,' Mrs. Cotterill said, "'I could run this house without a servant, and have myself tidy by ten o'clock in the morning.' And Mrs. Machin nodded. "'And then, when you want a regular turn-out, as you call it,' said Denry, "'there's the vacuum-cleaner.' The vacuum-cleaner was at that period the last word of civilization, and the first agency for it was being set up in Bursley. Denry explained the vacuum-cleaner to the housewives, who had got no further than a U-bank, and they again called down blessings on themselves. "'What price this supper?' Denry exclaimed. "'We ought to eat it. I'm sure he'd like us to eat it. Do sit down, all of you.' "'I'll take the consequences.' Mrs. Machin hesitated even more than the other ladies. "'It's really very strange, him not being here.' She shook her head. "'Don't I tell you he's quite mad?' said Denry. "'I shouldn't think he was so mad as all that,' said Mrs. Machin, dryly. "'This is the most sensible kind of house I've ever seen.' "'Oh, is it?' Denry answered. "'Great Scott! I never noticed those three bottles of wine on the sideboard.' At length he succeeded in seating them at table. Thenceforth there was no difficulty. The ample and diversified cold supper began to disappear steadily, and the wine with it. And as the wine disappeared, so did Mr. Cotterill, who had been pompous and taciturn, grow talkative, offering to the company the exact figures of the cost of the house, and so forth. But ultimately the sheer joy of life killed arithmetic. Mrs. Machin, however, could not quite rid herself of the notion that she was in a dream that outraged the proprieties. The entire affair for an unromantic spot like Bursley was too fantastically and wickedly romantic. "'We must be thinking about home, Denry,' said she. "'Plenty of time,' Denry replied. "'What, all that wine gone? I'll see if there's any more in the sideboard.' He emerged with a red face from bending into the deeps of the enamelled sideboard, and a wine-bottle was in his triumphant hand. It had already been opened. "'Hooray!' he proclaimed, pouring a white wine into his glass, and raising the glass. "'Here's to the health of Mr. Cecil Wilbraham.' He made a brave tableau in the brightness of the electric light. Then he drank. Then he dropped the glass, which broke. "'Ugh! What's that?' he demanded, with the distorted features of a gargoyle. His mother, who was seated next to him, seized the bottle. Denry's hand, in clasping the bottle, had hidden a small label, which said, "'Poison! Nettleship's patent enamel-cleaning fluid! One wipe does it!' Confusion! Only Nellie Cotterill seemed to be incapable of realising that a grave accident had occurred. She had laughed throughout the supper, and she still laughed, hysterically, though she had drunk scarcely any wine. Her mother silenced her. Denry was the first to recover. "'It'll be all right,' said he, leaning back in his chair. "'They always put a bit of poison in those things. "'Can't hurt me, really. I never noticed the label.' Mrs. Machin smelt at the bottle. She could detect no odour. But the fact that she could detect no odour appeared only to increase her alarm. "'You must have an emetic instantly,' she said. "'Oh, no,' said Denry. "'I shall be all right.' And he did seem to be suddenly restored. "'You must have an emetic instantly,' she repeated. "'What can I have?' he grumbled. "'You can't expect to find emetics here.' "'Oh, yes, I can,' said she. "'I saw a mustard tin in a cupboard in the kitchen. "'Come along now, and don't be silly.' Nellie's hysteric mirth surged up again. Denry objected to accompanying his mother into the kitchen, but he was forced to submit. She shut the door on both of them. It is probable that during the seven minutes which they spent mysteriously together in the kitchen— the practicability of the kitchen apparatus for carrying off waste products was duly tested. Denry came forth, very pale and very cross, on his mother's arm. "'There's no danger now,' said his mother easily. Naturally, the party was at an end. The Cotterills sympathised and prepared to depart, and inquired whether Denry could walk home. 
Denry replied from a sofa, in a weak, expiring voice, that he was perfectly incapable of walking home, that his sensations were in the highest degree disconcerting, that he should sleep in that house, as the bedrooms were ready for occupation, and that he should expect his mother to remain also. And Mrs. Machin had to concur. Mrs. Machin sped the cotterills from the door, as though it had been her own door. She was exceedingly angry and agitated, but she could not impart her feelings to the suffering Denry. He moaned on a bed for about half an hour, and then fell asleep. And in the middle of the night, in the dark, strange house, she also fell asleep. 6. The next morning she arose and went forth, and in about half an hour returned. Denry was still in bed, but his health seemed to have resumed its normal excellence. Mrs. Machin burst in upon him, in such a state of complicated excitement as he had never before seen her in. Denry, she cried, "'what do you think?' "'What?' said he. "'I've just been down home, and they're, they're pulling the house down, all the furniture's out, and they've got all the tiles off the roof, and the windows out, and there's a regular crowd watching.' Denry sat up. "'And I can tell you another piece of news,' said he. "'Mr. Cecil Wilbraham is dead.' dead she breathed yes said denry i think he's served his purpose as we're here we'll stop here don't forget it's the most sensible kind of a house you've ever seen don't forget that mrs cotterill could run it without a servant and have herself tidy by ten o'clock in the morning mrs machin perceived then in a flash of terrible illumination that there never had been any cecil wilbraham that Denry had merely invented him, and his long moustaches, and his wall eye, for the purpose of getting the better of his mother. The whole affair was an immense swindle upon her. Not a Mr. Cecil Wilbraham, but her own son had bought her cottage over her head, and jockeyed her out of it, beyond any chance of getting into it again. And to defeat his mother, the rascal had not simply perverted the innocent Nellie Cotterill to some co-operation in his scheme— but he had actually bought four other cottages, because the landlord would not sell one alone, and he was actually demolishing property to the sole end of stopping her from re-entering it. Of course the entire town soon knew the upshot of the battle, of the year-long battle between Denry and his mother, and the means adopted by Denry to win. The town also had been hoodwinked, but it did not mind that. It loved its Denry the more— and seeing that he was now properly established in the most remarkable house in the district, it soon afterwards made him a town councillor, as some reward for his talent in amusing it. And Denry would say to himself, "'Everything went like clockwork, except the mustard and water. I didn't bargain for the mustard and water. And yet, if I was clever enough to think of putting a label on the bottle, and to have the beds prepared, I ought to have been clever enough to keep mustard out of the house.' It would be wrong to mince the unpleasant fact that the sham poisoning which he had arranged to the end that he and his mother should pass the night in the house had finished in a manner much too realistic for Denry's pleasure. Mustard and water, particularly when mixed by Mrs. Machin, is mustard and water. She had that consolation. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 The Great Newspaper War 1. When Denry and his mother had been established a year and a month in the new house at Bleakridge, Denry received a visit one evening which perhaps flattered him more than anything had ever flattered him. The visitor was Mr. Myson. Now Mr. Myson was the founder, proprietor, and editor of the Five Towns Weekly, a new organ of public opinion which had been in existence about a year and Denry thought that Mr. Myson had popped in to see him in pursuit of an advertisement of the thrift club, and at first he was not at all flattered. But Mr. Myson was not hunting for advertisements, and Denry soon saw him to be the kind of man who would be likely to depute that work to others. Of middle height, well and quietly dressed, with a sober, assured deportment, he spoke in a voice and accent that were not of the five towns. They were superior to the five towns and in fact Mr. Myson originated in Manchester, and had seen London. He was not provincial, and he beheld the five towns as part of the provinces, 
which no native of the Five Towns ever succeeds in doing. Nevertheless, his manner to Denry was the summit of easy and yet deferential politeness. He asked permission to put something before Denry, and when, rather taken aback by such smooth phrases, Denry had graciously accorded the permission, he gave a brief history of the Five Towns Weekly, showing how its circulation had grown, and definitely stating that at that moment it was yielding a profit. Then he said, "'Now, my scheme is to turn it into a daily.' "'Very good notion,' said Denry, instinctively. "'I'm glad you think so,' said Mr. Myson, "'because I've come here in the hope of getting your assistance. "'I'm a stranger to the district, "'and I want the cooperation of someone who isn't. "'So I've come to you. "'I need money, of course.' though I have myself what most people would consider sufficient capital, but what I need more than money is, well, moral support. "'And who put you on to me?' asked Denry. Mr. Myson smiled. "'I put myself on to you,' said he. "'I think I may say I've got my bearings in the five towns, after a year's journalism in it, and it appeared to me that you were the best man I could approach. I always believe in flying high.' Therein was Denry flattered. The visit seemed to him to seal his position in the district, in a way in which his election to the Bursley Town Council had failed to do. He had been somehow disappointed with that election. He had desired to display his interest in the serious welfare of the town, and to answer his opponent's arguments with better ones. But the burgesses of his ward appeared to have no passionate love of logic. They just cried, "'Good old Denry!' and elected him with a majority of only forty-one votes. He had expected to feel a different Denry when he could put councillor before his name. It was not so. He had been solemnly in the mayoral procession to church. He had attended meetings of the council. He had been nominated to the watch committee. But he was still precisely the same Denry, though the youngest member of the council. But now he was being recognised from the outside. Mr. Myson's keen Manchester eye ranging over the quarter of a million inhabitants of the five towns in search of a representative individual force, had settled on Denry Machin. Yes, he was flattered. Mr. Myson's choice threw a rose light on all Denry's career, his wealth and its origin, his house and stable, which were the astonishment and admiration of the town, his universal thrift club, yea, and his councillorship. After all, these were marvels— and possibly the greatest marvel was the resigned presence of his mother in that wondrous house, and the fact that she consented to employ Rose Chud, the incomparable Sappho of charwomen, for three hours every day. In fine, he perceived from Mr. Myson's eyes that his position was unique, and after they had chatted a little, and the conversation had deviated momentarily from journalism to house property, he offered to display Machin House, as he had christened it, to Mr. Myson, and Mr. Myson was really impressed beyond the ordinary. Mr. Myson's homage to Mrs. Machin, whom they chanced on in the paradise of the bathroom, was the polished mirror of courtesy. How Denry wished that he could behave like that when he happened to meet countesses. Then once more in the drawing-room they resumed the subject of newspapers. "'You know,' said Mr. Myson, it really is a very bad thing indeed for a district to have only one daily newspaper. I've nothing myself to say against the Staffordshire Signal, but you'd perhaps be astonished, this in a confidential tone, at the feeling there is against the Signal in many quarters. Really, said Denry. Of course, its fault is that it isn't sufficiently interested in the great public questions of the district, and it can't be, because it can't take a definite side. It must try to please all parties. At any rate, it must offend none. That is the great evil of a journalistic monopoly. Two hundred and fifty thousand people! Why, there is an ample public for two first-class papers. Look at Nottingham, look at Bristol, look at Leeds, look at Sheffield, and their newspapers. And Denry endeavoured to look at these great cities. Truly, the five towns was just about as big. The dizzy journalistic intoxication seized him. He did not give Mr. Myson an answer at once, but he gave himself an answer at once. He would go into the immense adventure. He was very friendly with the signal people, certainly, but business was business, 
and the highest welfare of the five towns was the highest welfare of the five towns. Soon afterwards, all the hoardings of the district spoke with one blue voice, and said that the five towns weekly was to be transformed into the five towns daily, with four editions, beginning each day at noon, and that the new organ would be conducted on the lines of a first-class evening paper. The inner ring of knowing ones knew that a company entitled The Five Towns Newspapers Limited had been formed with a capital of ten thousand pounds, and that Mr. Myson held three thousand pounds worth of shares, and the great Denry Machin one thousand five hundred, and that the remainder were to be sold and allotted as occasion demanded. The inner ring said that nothing would ever be able to stand up against the signal, and on the other hand it admitted that Denry, the most prodigious card ever borne into the five towns, had never been floored by anything. The inner ring anticipated the future with glee. Denry and Mr. Myson anticipated the future with righteous confidence. As for the signal, it went on its august way, blind to sensational hoardings. 2. On the day of the appearance of the first issue of the Five Towns Daily, the offices of the new paper at Hanbridge gave proof of their excellent organisation, working in all details with an admirable smoothness. In the basement a Marinoni machine thundered like a sucking-dove to produce fifteen thousand copies an hour. On the ground floor ingenious arrangements had been made for publishing the paper. In particular, the iron railings to keep the boys in order in front of the publishing counter had been imitated from the signal. On the first floor was the editor and founder with his staff, and above that the composing department. The number of stairs that separated the composing department from the machine-room was not a positive advantage, but bricks and mortar are inelastic, and one does what one can. The offices looked very well from the outside, and they compared passably with the offices of the signal close by. The posters were duly in the ground-floor windows, and gold signs, one above another, to the roof, produced an air of lucrative success. Denry happened to be in the daily offices that afternoon. He had had nothing specially to do with the details of the organisation, for details of organisation were not his speciality. His speciality was large, leading ideas. He knew almost nothing of the agreements with correspondence and press association and central news and the racing services and the fiction departments, nor of the difficulties with the compositors' union, nor of the struggle to lower the price of paper by the twentieth of a penny per pound, nor of the awful discounts allowed to certain advertisers, nor of the friction with the railway company, nor of the sickening adulation that had been lavished on quite unimportant news agents, nor, worst of all, of the dearth of newsboys. These matters did not attract him. He could not stoop to them. But when Mr. Myson, calm and proud, escorted him down to the machine-room, and the Marinoni threw a folded pink daily almost into his hands, and it looked exactly like a real newspaper, and he saw one of his own descriptive articles in it, and he reflected that he was an owner of it, then Denry was attracted and delighted, and his heart beat for this pink thing was the symbol and result of the whole affair, and had the effect of a miracle on him. And he said to himself, never guessing how many thousands of men had said it before him, that a newspaper was the finest toy in the world. About four o'clock the publisher, in shirt-sleeves and an apron, came up to Mr. Myson, and respectfully asked him to step into the publishing office. Mr. Myson stepped into the publishing office, and Denry with him and they there beheld a small ragged boy with a bleeding nose and a bundle of dailies in his wounded hand. "'Yes,' the boy sobbed, "'and they said they'd cut my eyes out and take marbles with him if they cotched me in Crown Square again.' And he threw down the papers with a final yell. The two directors learnt that the delicate threat had been uttered by four signal boys, who had objected to any fellow-boys offering any paper other than the signal for sale in Crown Square or anywhere else. Of course it was absurd. Still, absurd as it was, it continued. The central publishing offices of the Daily at Hanbridge, and its branch offices in the neighbouring towns, were like military hospitals, and the truth appeared to the directors, that while the public was panting to buy copies of the Daily, 
The sale of the daily was being prevented by means of a scandalous conspiracy on the part of signal boys. For it must be understood that in the five towns people prefer to catch their newspaper in the street as it flies and cries. The signal had a vast army of boys, to whom every year it gave a great fate. Indeed, the signal possessed nearly all the available boys, and assuredly all the most pugilistic and strongest boys. Mr. Myson had obtained boys only after persistent inquiry and demand, and such as he had found were not the fittest, and therefore were unlikely to survive. You would have supposed that in a district that never ceases to grumble about bad trade and unemployment, thousands of boys would have been delighted to buy the daily at fourpence a dozen and sell it at sixpence, but it was not so. On the second day, the dearth of boys at the offices of the daily was painful. There was that magnificent, enterprising newspaper waiting to be sold, and there was the great, enlightened public waiting to buy, and scarcely any business could be done, because the signal boys had established a reign of terror over their puny and upstart rival. The situation was unthinkable. Still, unthinkable as it was, it continued. Mr. Myson had thought of everything except this— Naturally, it had not occurred to him that an immense and serious effort for the general wheel was going to be blocked by a gang of tatterdemalions. He complained with dignity to the signal, and was informed with dignity by the signal that the signal could not be responsible for the playful antics of its boys in the streets, that, in short, the Five Towns was a free country. In the latter proposition, Mr. Myson did not concur. After trouble in the persuasion of parents— astonishing how indifferent the Five Towns' parent was to the loss of blood by his offspring, a case reached the police court. At the hearing the signal gave a solicitor a watching brief, and that solicitor expressed the signal's horror of carnage. The evidence was excessively contradictory, and the stipendiary dismissed the summons with a good joke. The sole definite result was that the boy whose father had ostensibly brought the summons got his ear torn within a quarter of an hour of leaving the court. Boys will be boys. Still, the Daily had so little faith in human nature that it could not believe that the signal was not secretly encouraging its boys to be boys. It could not believe that the signal, out of a sincere desire for fair play, and for the highest welfare of the district, would willingly sacrifice nearly half its circulation and a portion of its advertisement revenue. And the hurt tone of Mr. Myson's leading articles seemed to indicate that, in Mr. Myson's opinion, his old arrival ought to do everything in its power to ruin itself. The Signal never spoke of the fight. The Daily gave shocking details of it every day. The struggle trailed on through the weeks. Then Denry had one of his ideas— an advertisement was printed in the daily for two hundred able-bodied men to earn two shillings for working six hours a day. An address different from the address of the daily was given. By a ruse, Denry procured the insertion of the advertisement in the signal also. "'We must expend our capital on getting the paper onto the street,' said Denry. "'That's evident. We'll have it sold by men. We'll soon see if the signal ragamuffins will attack them.' "'And we won't pay em by results. We'll pay em a fixed wage. That'll fetch em. And a commission on sales into the bargain. Well, I wouldn't mind engaging five hundred men. Swamp the streets. That's it. Hang expense. And when we've done the trick, we can go back to the boys. They'll have learnt their lesson.' And Mr. Myson agreed, and was pleased that Denry was living up to his reputation. The state of the earthenware trade was supposed that summer to be worse than it had been since 1869, and the grumblings of the unemployed were prodigious, even seditious. Mr. Myson, therefore, as a measure of precaution, engaged a couple of policemen to ensure order at the address, and during the hours named in the advertisement as a rendezvous for respectable men in search of a well-paid job. Having regard to the thousands of perishing families in the five towns, he foresaw a rush and a crush of eager breadwinners. Indeed, the arrangements were elaborate. Forty minutes after the advertised time for the opening of the reception of respectable men in search of money, four men had arrived. Mr. Myson, mystified, thought that there had been a mistake in the advertisement. But there was no mistake in the advertisement. A little later, two more men came— of the six, three were tipsy, and the other three absolutely declined to be seen selling papers in the streets. 
Two were abusive, one facetious. Mr. Myson did not know his five towns, nor did Denry. A five towns man, when he can get neither bread nor beer, will keep himself and his family on pride and water. The policeman went off to more serious duties. 3. Then came the announcement of the thirty-fifth anniversary of the signal, and of the processional fate by which the signal was at once to give itself a splendid spectacular advertisement, and to reward and enhearten its boys. The signal meant to liven up the streets of the five towns on that great day, by means of a display of all the gilt chariots of Snape's circus in the main thoroughfare. Many of the boys would be in the gilt chariots. Copies of the anniversary number of the signal would be sold from the gilt chariots. The idea was excellent, and it showed that, after all, the signal was getting just a little more afraid of its young rival than it had pretended to be. For strange to say, after a trying period of hesitation, the Five Towns Daily was slightly on the upward curve, thanks to Denry. Denry did not mean to be beaten by the puzzle which the Daily offered to his intelligence. There the Daily was, full of news and with quite an encouraging show of advertisements, printed on real paper, with real ink, and yet it would not go. Notoriously, the signal earned a net profit of at the very least five thousand a year, whereas the Daily earned a net loss of at the very least sixty pounds a week, and of that sixty quite a third was Denry's money. He could not explain it. Mr. Myson tried to rouse the public by passionately stirring up extremely urgent matters, such as the smoke nuisance, the increase of the rates, the park question, German competition, technical education for apprentices, but the public obstinately would not be roused concerning its highest welfare to the point of insisting on the regular supply of the daily. If a mere five thousand souls had positively demanded daily a copy of the daily, and not slept till boys or agents had responded to their wish, the troubles of the daily would soon have vanished. But this ridiculous public did not seem to care which paper was put into its hand in exchange for its halfpenny so long as the sporting news was put there. It simply was indifferent. It failed to see the importance to such an immense district of having two flourishing and mutually opposing daily organs. The fundamental boy difficulty remained ever-present. And it was the boy difficulty that Denry perseveringly and ingeniously attacked, until at length the daily did indeed possess some sort of brigade of its own, and the bullying and slaughter in the streets so amusing to the inhabitants, grew a little less one-sided. A week or more before the signal's anniversary day, Denry heard that the signal was secretly afraid lest the Daly's brigade might accomplish the marring of its gorgeous procession, and that the signal was ready to do anything to smash the Daly's brigade. He laughed. He said he did not mind. About that time hostilities were rather acute, blood was warming, and both papers, in the excitation of rivalry, had partially lost the sense of what was due to the dignity of great organs. By chance a tremendous local football match, Knipe versus Bursley, fell on the very Saturday of the procession. The rival arrangements for the reporting of the match were as tremendous as the match itself, and somehow the match seemed to add keenness to the journalistic struggle especially as the daily favoured Bursley, and the signal was therefore forced to favour Knype. By all the laws of hazard, there ought to have been a hitch on that historic Saturday. Telephone or telegraph ought to have broken down, or rain ought to have made play impossible. But no hitch occurred, and at five-thirty o'clock of a glorious afternoon in earliest November, the daily went to press with a truly brilliant account of the manner in which Bursley, for the first and last time in its history, had defeated Knight by one goal to none. Mr. Myson was proud. Mr. Myson defied the signal to beat his descriptive report. As for the signal's procession, well, Mr. Myson and the chief sub-editor of the Daily glanced at each other and smiled. And a few minutes later the Daily boys were rushing out of the publishing-room with bundles of papers, assuredly in advance of the signal. It was at this juncture that the unexpected began to occur to the Daily boys. The publishing door of the Daily opened into Stanway Rents, 
a narrow alley in a maze of mean streets behind Crown Square. In Stanway Rents was a small warehouse, in which, according to rumours of the afternoon, a free soup-kitchen was to be opened, and just before the football edition of the Daily came off the Marinoni, it emphatically was opened, and there issued from its inviting gate an odour, not, to be sure, of soup, but of toasted cheese and hot jam, such an odour as had never before tempted the nostrils of a daily boy, a unique and omnipotent odour. Several boys, who, I may state frankly, were traitors to the daily cause, spies and mischief-makers from elsewhere, raced unhesitatingly in, crying that toasted cheese sandwiches and jam tarts were to be distributed like lightning to all authentic newspaper lads. The entire gang followed, scores, over a hundred, inwardly expecting to emerge instantly with teeth fully employed, followed like a sheep into a fold. And the gate was shut. Toasted cheese and hot jammy pastry were faithfully served to the ragged host, but with no breathless haste. And when, loaded, the boys struggled to depart, they were instructed by the kind philanthropist who had fed them to depart by another exit, and they discovered themselves in an enclosed yard, of which the double doors were apparently unyielding, and the warehouse door was shut also. And as the cheese and jam disappeared, shouts of fury arose on the air. The yard was so close to the offices of the daily that the chimney-pots of those offices could actually be seen, and yet the shouting brought no answer from the lords of the daily, congratulating themselves up there on their fine account of the football match, and on their celerity in going to press, and on the loyalty of their brigade. The signal, it need not be said, disavowed complicity in this extraordinary entrapping of the daily brigade by means of an odour. Could it be held responsible for the excesses of its disinterested sympathisers? Still, the appalling trick showed the high temperature to which blood had risen in the genial battle between great rival organs. Persons in the inmost ring whispered that Denry Machin had at length been bested on this critically important day. 4. Snape's Circus used to be one of the great shining institutions of North Staffordshire, trailing its magnificence on sculptured wheels from town to town, and occupying the dreams of boys from one generation to another. Its headquarters were at Axe, in the Moorlands, ten miles away from Hambridge, but the riches of old Snape had chiefly come from the five towns. At the time of the struggle between the Signal and the Daily, its decline had already begun. The aged proprietor had recently died, and the name and the horses and the chariots and the carefully repaired tents had been sold to strangers. On the Saturday of the anniversary and the football match, which was also Martinmas Saturday, the circus was set up at Oldcastle, on the edge of the five towns, and was giving its final performances of the season. Even boys will not go to circuses in the middle of a five-towns winter. The signal people had hired the processional portion of Snape's for the late afternoon and early evening, and the instructions were that the entire cortege should be round about the signal offices in marching order not later than five o'clock. But at four o'clock several gentlemen with rosettes in their buttonholes and signal posters in their hands arrived important and panting at the fair ground of Oldcastle, and announced that the programme had been altered at the last moment, in order to defeat certain feared machinations of the unscrupulous daily. The cavalcade was to be split into three groups, one of which, the chief, was to enter Hanbridge by a back road, and the other two were to go to Bursley and Longshaw, respectively. In this manner the forces of advertisement would be distributed, and the chief parts of the district equally honoured. The special linen banners, pennons, and ribbons bearing the words, Signal, 35th Anniversary, etc., had already been hung and planted and draped around the gilded summits of the chariots, and after some delay the processions were started, separating at the bottom of the cattle market. The head of the Hanbridge part of the procession consisted of an enormous car of Jupiter, with six wheels and thirty-six paragonical figures, as the clown used to say and drawn by six piebald steeds guided by white reins. This coach had a windowed interior. At the great affairs it sometimes served as a box-office. And in the interior one of the delegates of the signal had fixed himself, 
From it he directed the paths of the procession. It would be futile longer to conceal that the delegate of the signal in the bowels of the car of Jupiter was not honestly a delegate of the signal at all. He was indeed Denry Machin, and none other. From this single fact it will be seen to what extent the representative of great organs had forgotten what was due to their dignity and to public decency. Esconced in his lair, Denry directed the main portion of the Signal's advertising procession by all manner of discreet lanes round the skirts of Hambridge and so into the town from the hilly side, and ultimately the ten vehicles halted in Crapper Street to the joy of the simple inhabitants. Denry emerged and wandered innocently towards the offices of his paper, which were close by. It was getting late. The first yelling of the imprisoned daily boys was just beginning to rise on the autumn air. Suddenly Denry was accosted by a young man. "'Hallo, Machin!' cried the young man. "'What have you shaved your beard off for? I scarcely knew you.' "'I just uh, thought I would, Swetnam,' said Denry, who was obviously discomposed. It was the youngest of the Swetnam boys. He and Denry had taken a sort of curt fancy to one another. "'I say,' said Swetnam confidentially, as if obeying a swift impulse, "'I did hear that the signal people meant to collar all your chaps this afternoon, and I believe they have done. Hear that now?' Swetnam's father was intimate with the signal people. "'I know,' Denry replied. "'But, but I mean, papers and all.' "'I know,' said Denry. "'Oh,' murmured Swetnam. "'But I'll tell you a secret,' Denry added. "'They aren't today's papers. "'They're yesterday's, and last week's, and last month's. "'We've been collecting them specially, "'and keeping them nice and new-looking.' "'Well, you're a caution,' murmured Swetnam. "'I am,' Denry agreed. "'A number of men rushed at that instant "'with bundles of the genuine football edition "'from the offices of the Daily.' "'Come on!' Denry cried to them. "'Come on! This way! Bye-bye, Swetnam!' And the whole file vanished round a corner. The yelling of imprisoned, cheese-fed boys grew louder. 5. In the meantime, at the signal office, which was not three hundred yards away, but on the other side of Crown Square, apprehension had deepened into anxiety as the minutes passed, and the Snape Circus procession persisted in not appearing on the horizon of the Old Castle Road. The signal would have telephoned to Snape's, but for the fact that a circus is never on the telephone. It then telephoned to its old castle agent, who, after a long delay, was able to reply that the cavalcade had left Old Castle at the appointed hour, with every sign of health and energy. Then the signal sent forth scouts, all down the Old Castle road, to put spurs into the procession, and the scouts returned, having seen nothing. Pessimists glanced at the possibility of the whole procession having fallen into the canal at Calden Bridge. The paper was printed, the train parcels for Knype, Longshaw, Bursley, and Turnhill were dispatched, the boys were waiting, the fingers of the clock in the publishing department were simply flying. It had been arranged that the bulk of the Hanbridge edition, and in particular the first copies of it, should be sold by boys from the gilt chariots themselves. The publisher hesitated for an awful moment, and then decided that he could wait no more, and that the boys must sell the papers in the usual way from the pavements and gutters. There was no knowing what the daily might not be doing. And then signal boys in dozens rushed forth paper-laden, but they were disappointed boys. They had thought to ride in gilt chariots, not to paddle in mud. And almost the first thing they saw in Crown Square was the car of Jupiter in its glory flying all the signal colours, and other cars behind. They did not rush now, they sprang as from a catapult, and alighted like flies on the vehicles. Men insisted on taking their papers from them, and paying for them on the spot. The boys were startled, they were entirely puzzled, but they had not the habit of refusing money. And off went the procession to the music of its own band, down the road to Nipe, and perhaps a hundred boys on board, cheering. The men in charge then performed a curious act. They tore down all the signal flagging, and replaced it with the emblem of the daily, so that all the great and enlightened public, wandering home in crowds from the football match at Knype, had the spectacle of a daily procession instead of a signal procession, 
and could scarce believe their eyes, and dailies were sold in quantities from the cars. At Knipe Station the procession curved and returned to Hambridge, and finally, after a multitudinous triumph, came to a stand, with all its daily bunting, in front of the signal offices, and Denry appeared from his lair. Denry's men fled with bundles. "'They're an hour and a half late,' said Denry calmly to one of the proprietors of the signal, who was on the pavement. "'But I've managed to get them here. I thought I'd just look in to thank you for giving such a good feed to our lads.' The telephones hummed with news of similar daily processions in Longshore and Bursley, and there was not a high-class private bar in the district that did not tinkle with delighted astonishment at the brazen, the inconceivable effrontery of that card Denry Machin. Many people foresaw lawsuits, but it was agreed that the signal had begun the game of impudence in trapping the daily lads so as to secure a holy calm for its much-trumpeted procession and Denry had not finished with the signal. In the special football edition of the Daily was an announcement, the first, of special Martinmas fates organised by the Five Towns Daily, and on that same morning every member of the Universal Thrift Club had received an invitation to said fates. They were three, held on public ground at Hanbridge, Bursley, and Longshore. They were in the style of the usual Five Towns wakes, that's to say, roundabouts, shows, gingerbread stalls, swings, coconut shies. But at each fete a new and very simple form of shy had been erected. It consisted of a row of small railway signals. "'March up! March up!' cried the shy men. "'Knock down the signal! Knock down the signal! And the packet of Turkish delight is yours! Knock down the signal!' And when you had knocked down the signal— the men cried, "'We wrap it up for you in the special anniversary number of the signal!' And they disdainfully tore into suitable fragments, copies of the signal, which had cost Denry and Co. a halfpenny each, and enfolded the Turkish delight therein, and handed it to you with a smack. And all the fairgrounds were carpeted with draggled and muddy signals. People were up to the ankles in signals. The affair was the talk of Sunday— Few matters in the five towns have raised more gossip than did that enormous escapade, which Denry had invented and conducted. The moral damage to the signal was held to approach the disastrous, and now not the possibility, but the probability of lawsuits was incessantly discussed. On the Monday both papers were bought with anxiety. Everybody was frothing to know what the respective editors would say. But in neither sheet was there a single word as to the affair. Both had determined to be discreet. Both were afraid. The signal feared lest it might not, if the pinch came, be able to prove its innocence of the crime of luring boys into confinement by means of toasted cheese and hot jam. The signal had also to consider its seriously damaged dignity. For such wounds silence is the best dressing. The daily was comprehensively afraid. It had practically driven its gilded chariots through the entire decalogue. Moreover, it had won easily in the grand altercation. It was exquisitely conscious of glory. Denry went away to Blackpool, doubtless to grow his beard. The proof of the daily's moral and material victory was that soon afterwards there were four applicants, men of substance, for shares in the daily company. And this, by the way, was the end of the tale. For these applicants, who secured options on a majority of the shares, were emissaries of the signal. Armed with the options, the signal made terms with its rival, and then, by mutual agreement, killed it. The price of its death was no trifle, but it was less than a year's profits of the signal. Denry considered that he had been done, but in the depths of his heart he was glad that he had been done, he had had too disconcerting a glimpse of the rigours and perils of journalism to wish to continue it. He had scored supremely, and, for him, to score was life itself. His reputation as a card was far, far higher than ever. Had he so desired, he could have been elected to the House of Commons on the strength of his procession and fate. Mr. Myson, somewhat scandalised by the exuberance of his partner, returned to Manchester, and the signal, subsequently often referred to as the old lady, resumed its monopolistic sway over the opinions of a quarter of a million of people, 
and has never since been attacked. End of chapter 9